This video was brought to you by the fine patrons on my Patreon page. These videos are totally ad free and if you like this content, take a look at the Patreon page in the description below and consider donating to keep this channel growing. On to the video. First things first, now I'm really happy that this is the game I'm playing right now. The year was 2007, year of Mass Effect. When this game first came out, I was living in Buena Park, California, right across from Knott's Berry Farms, which is Orange County's version of Six Flags. I lived with a friend of mine at the time, as well as with my girlfriend. And at that time, in my old life, I did a lot of partying. I used to go to a place called the Vanguard on certain weekdays because the DJ there was amazeballs. Then we went to Circus Disco on Saturdays for much the same reason. Then when John Digweed was DJing at the Avalon, I was there. Then, after hours, we would party at a friend's house who DJed on the top floor of the Avalon. Why am I telling you this? Well, I had plenty of options for what I could be doing on any given weekend, and instead what I chose to do was boot up my Xbox and play Mass Effect until the wee hours of the night. Even when my girlfriend had come home from the club and was trying to sleep, I was shooting Geth and smacking reporters in her dome. I probably sound biased to you, and I am. Oh lord, am I ever biased? And if this is news to you? then you must be new to this channel. Welcome, by the way. I hope your butt doesn't hurt too much because you're going to be sitting for a while listening to this. When this game was in development, I remember seeing single screenshots of it on GameSpot of the lead character. He was in a futuristic bar drenched in neon and subtle lens flare, and I was, I was blown away. The developers talked about their inspirations. Blade Runner was mentioned, and this got me moist, as it is one of my favorite movies. I was curious about the combat, however. See, I was used to the kind of combat that Bioware usually made. Real-time, turn-based combat. Nothing wrong with that, but my desire was to see a sci-fi role-playing game that had realistic gunplay. There was a hole in gaming at this point that had yet to be filled. Deus Ex was there, giving PC players what they wanted, but to be frank, well, the combat was a bit... Well, not fluid. Let's be kind to one of my favorite games, yeah? But no one was doing this. No one was talking about the interaction and depth of choice that Bioware was fast becoming known for and translating that into an action game with mechanics from an FPS. Okay, damn it. I, yes, we had Elder Scrolls, but Elder Scrolls didn't have guns, so shove that into your pipe and smoke it. I think it's pretty well established that there weren't any games doing this back then, aside from maybe a few standouts. All right, that doesn't count. Alright, what I mean is, yes, there were a ton of RPG-like shooters coming out back then, but there weren't many true RPGs out there that used RPG mechanics like dialogue branches, weapon proficiencies, and SPACE MAGIC, and long-lasting consequences as core mechanics, okay? Can we all agree to that? that that's not in space! Fuck off! Okay, no, no fuck it. Alright, I'm done. Fuck it. No, 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 I'm resorting to a really lame fucking YouTuber joke. Yep, I'm walking off camera and I'm, I'm done, yeah. Okay, I guess it wasn't because I had never played anything like it before. I think it was because, in almost all of those games, none of them were made by Bioware. At the time, Bioware was teasing that the series would be a trilogy, and all decisions you made in previous games would carry over to other games. This was the missing ingredient. In Baldur's Gate 2, your character levels and stats would carry over to the new game, but your decisions were meaningless because you were in a new land where no one had ever heard of you before, for the most part. In Mass Effect, however, the thought that decisions were persistent meant that Bioware was following a design philosophy that was a natural evolution of the RPG formula. That meant, at least to me, that the game had meaningful choices, was set in a sci-fi universe, and was a shooter. It was like someone went into my brain and designed a game for my wet dreams. Then it was released to the public and I lost myself in this game. I shrugged off social commitments, took off work early to play it, but why? Why do people like this game so much? Well, let's dig in, shall we? This game knows what it is. It's a sleek future vision of a human race that has achieved galactic travel. What would a future like this look like and how would you create a military vet in a world like this? When I say that Bioware nearly thought of everything in terms of tone, atmosphere, and style, this is obvious even in the character creation screen. It sets you up with the premise that your military data has been corrupted and you must painstakingly recreate this info. My favorite part is the pre-service history, which allows you to pick one of three origin stories and one psychological profile. 
In most games, things like this would only affect a stat. In another game, you might get a plus two to survival if you pick the survivalish trait. But in Mass Effect, much like in Tyranny, people recognize you for your past, and sometimes events will happen because of your particular past. And this makes these choices so much more impactful than a simple stat upgrade. The thing that I really like about this is that it gives me a predetermined jumping off point for who my Shepard is and how he will react in a given situation. I picked Colonist for Origin and War Hero for my psychological profile, and Infiltrator for my class. I picked Infiltrator not because I like the sniper rifles in this game, believe me, I hate the sniper rifles in this game, but because I had this particular picture in my head of a man that was a war hero, but who came from squalor and is used to living with filth. He would be remorseless to his enemies, but caring towards his fellow comrades, but would not abide by whining or excuses. I had heard a quote from a famous American sniper who was being interviewed. The interviewer supposedly asked this sniper, what do you feel when you shoot people? And the sniper responded, recoil. Now, this is a bit of a legend more than fact, but that's who I pictured my shepherd being. And that is the most hardcore answer I think I've ever heard. In this playthrough, I decided that I would roleplay my character in a way I had never done before. This was an experiment to see if the Paragon and Renegade system would get in the way of my decision making if I did not play a straight goody two-shoes or a straight asshat. I am doing this because in order to answer the question, why do people like this game, it is important to know what systems work within an RPG and which were never intended to work that way at all. After we spend an hour tweaking the shape of our earlobes, the game begins. Hope. Without it, the previously heroic become the present day coward. With it, the coward can become the hero. The game opens up with a wide shot of a planet. Off screen, someone is talking about our character. Humanity needs a hero, Captain Anderson says, and Shepard's the best we've got. To give humanity hope in the frontier, Shepard is to be brought before the council as the first human specter. He will be a shining beacon in the dark, vast emptiness of space. However, Shepard knows none of this for now. Small bits of text flit across the screen to give us the background of the world, setting the stage much like a Star Wars movie does with its title crawls by telling us that the ancient spacefaring tech was found on Mars, and this jumped our own technology by hundreds of years, making what we thought impossible possible through the Mass Effect relays. Mass Effect plays double duty here, and it's a pretty clever name. Massive in the impact that the discovery had on humanity. Mass, as in the mass that it can propel against all laws of physics, and the seemingly massive effect that the marketing said we would have on the universe. We are introduced to the relays as what can only be described as space magic slingshots us through space. Once the cutscene plays, we are given our first look at the dialogue wheel. We are given three choices. I agree, you're overreacting, and cut the chatter. In Mass Effect, the three choices are representative of three attitudes, Paragon, Renegade, and Neutral. I hate these filthy Neutrals, Kiff. With enemies, you know where they stand, but with Neutrals, who knows? It sickens me. Now, I have a theory about Neutral dialogue choices, but that is why I am playing the game as a true RPG and not trying to game the system by holding up and to the left and smashing the action key. If I truly roleplay, Will the game lock me out of game-altering events? In other words, is Rex going to die because I was playing my way? The thing that Mass Effect 1 does so well is that the dialogue choices do, for the most part, make you feel like the person you're playing. You can guess with near certainty that if you pick a renegade choice, you are likely to do or say something that only a dickhead would say. And everybody is a dick to someone sometimes. Also, telling people to shut up and do their jobs never gets old. Sure, there is some dialogue that you're like, what? I didn't think I was going to say that. And yeah, that sucks, but it never detracted from the experience. And really, unless I was being really nitpicky, I wouldn't have even noticed it until someone from YouTube brought it up and I was like, hey, yeah, they did do that. Those bastards. The opening intro to the game does exposition and world building exquisitely. The way it works is the info is completely optional for the most part and resides in the investigate option of dialogue. Take this exchange with Presley. Before we can investigate, the game has told us important info. It tells us that something called a Spectre is on board, and that they are covert agents. 
Presley's suspicion is designed to make us curious to know more about specters and by extension, our mission. When we ask him about the Turian specter, he has this to say. You don't trust Nihilus. I don't like Turians in general, it runs in my family. My grandfather fought in the first contact war, lost a lot of friends when the Turians hit us. In less than a minute, we've learned what a specter is, at least in a limited way. We learn that they operate outside the law. I am the law. And we learn that humans fought against the Turians in a first contact war, and there seems to be a lot of bad blood because of it. And just a dash of good old xenophobia. The game has managed to give us several interesting pieces of info about the universe quickly. It says more with less words. This is what Mass Effect does that previous Bioware games couldn't, according to people. We then have the options to tool around the deck of the ship and speak to various crew members before we go to meet Nihilus. When we meet Nihilus, he tells us about how awesome we are, how we single-handedly wrecked faces into Blitz. They do all this because this scene is setting the stakes. In a plot sense, this would be the call to action. We are to be tested for the role of the first Spectre in the history of the human race. The title comes with much acclaim, but also much power. The reason this setup works is because the covert and powerful nature of the Spectres was pointed out by Presley earlier, but if you walked past them, you would have missed it, leaving you confused as to why you should care. You see, it's all very impressive to a writing nerd like me. The only problem is, if this was just a simple mission to pick up a thing and bring it back to a place, why is this some sort of grand test for Shepard? It doesn't seem very challenging. I mean, like, if the Reaper didn't attack, the test to become a Spectre literally would have been how well I handled standing around while people loaded some alien flagpole into my ship. Oh well, good thing that happened. Wouldn't want to think this was a plot contrivance or something. What's funny is that this plot contrivance could have easily been avoided if the reason they were going was because of the attack and not because they found the beacon. I know, I know, it's nitpicky, calm down. And then we drop the Eden Prime and it's... beautiful, I guess? First, let's start off with this little narrative dissonance the game's got going on right now. See, when people talk about Eden Prime, they talk about how beautiful it is. But, uh... This isn't a beautiful place. It's kind of a dump where the only fauna are floating bags of tumorous flesh. I'm not seeing all this beauty, and I guess an argument can be made that maybe Eden Prime is a victim of technological limitations of the engine, and maybe this is partly true. But I'm saying that from a purely art direction standpoint, see, this level has a brown sky, brown ground, and nearly the only color is the green leaves on the occasional tree. Hell, even the water is dark and ugly looking. There also seems to be a turd smeared into a fine grease all over my monitor. I should probably clean that up. Uh, yeah, it still looks terrible. So yeah, let's talk about these full screen filters for a minute. The first off is my number one annoyance the film grain effect, motion blur, and vignetting. The first two are easily fixed by a checkbox, but the vignette, which is the black edges at the corner of the screen, that's another story. I did some digging and there are some mods that can enhance the textures in Mass Effect to almost Mass Effect 3 quality, but installing it is a pain in the ass. I of course figured this out after I got through Eden Prime, so what you'll notice is a marked improvement after Eden Prime, but as for vignetting, I've yet to find a way to turn that shit off. If you want a better Mass Effect experience, I recommend looking at the Alot mod. That is A-L-O-T, Alot. You can find it on Nexus Mods and it comes with its own installer for ease of use. It's totally worth it. Now back to the game. A real go-getter of a soldier goes and gets himself killed in the first encounter and we're confronted with a choice. Either leave the guy on the ground and be all like, screw him, we got better things to do. Or he can be a not sociopath and tell Kaiden that we'll pick him up on the way back and this is what I mean about some of the renegade choices, man. When I think renegade, I think a dude with a leather jacket punching a jukebox to get it to play a song, not some emotionless douche nozzle. I think a renegade would be like, don't worry Kaiden, we'll make these bastards pay for what they've done. Not to mention that in the Rangers, you never leave a man behind. That's their motto, it's their creed. Shepard has been referred to as a marine. So you know what their motto is? Nemo Residio, Latin for leave no one behind. 
It is uncharacteristic of a soldier, especially a leader of men and women. Now, you can make the argument that, yeah, dude, he's a renegade. Renegades break with tradition. Sure, I could see that, but would you agree that renegades are also humans that care for people? Hmm? What about soldiers that they command? Taking this action makes Shepard look like a frickin' sociopath and is the main reason why I just can't get down with these renegade runs. Maybe it's my personality, but I just don't know why writers do this. Remember, the villain never believes they are the villain of their own story. I love the combat in this game. Yes, I know it's not perfect and there are bugs everywhere, but I really love the combat. Now, I've heard it being derided as being weird that a soldier is this inaccurate with their weapon after being a veteran of wars, but dude, firing a weapon isn't easy and besides, you're pretty accurate with your starting weapon. In fact, soldiers are the best if you plan on playing this as a shooter, but if you want the real experience, biotics and tech all the way, baby. I've also heard that this game as combat has been described as shallow. I don't know where this comes from. If you're getting stun locked by an enemy, and that's because you let the enemy catch you off guard, or they flanked you, or in some really bad cases surrounded you and kept putting your ass to sleep. The very same thing that people hate about this game are the very things I love because it's a challenge. Uh, we snag our second ally, Ashley Williams, and we get two choices. We can welcome her into the group or we can tell her that she abandoned her crew. Okay, listen, we don't know the circumstances that Ashley was in. For all we know, there was nothing that could be done. Again, the renegade option makes you sound like an asshat. Teleporting enemies! At this point in the game, you'll notice that you are getting a lot of loot of varying quality, and this is something I remember loving about the game. See, sometimes you loot things and you know what you've gotten right away, and other times, loot drops from kills and you don't figure that out until you go into the menu and notice that you have a list of stuff you haven't added to your inventory. Every time you hit the escape button, it's like an item pinata exploded in your backpack. It's a feeling so good that I'm surprised it wasn't turned into a loot box in later games. Let's talk about giving commands. Now, I don't know who thought it was a good idea to bind commands to the arrow keys in a game that uses WASD and mouse controls, but the last thing you want to do is take your hands off controls to give commands to brain dead team AI in a game that emphasizes cover, yet has blitz enemy mechanics that force you to move. But this is useless. I use the pause menu for this, and you know why? Well, let me point you to my previous statement about shallow combat. People have said this game has no strategy. That's what the pause menu is for. It's used for you to plan your next move when an enemy is flanking or rushing you. You might not know it to look at the game, but it gives you a ton of options if you build your party correctly. So far we have met two types of enemies. Both have different mechanics. We've got the Geth, which use weapons of all types like sniper rifles, assault rifles, rocket launchers, and then we have Husks, which are basically human hand grenades designed to force you out of cover for a nice headshot. Sorry if you hate them, but they work as designed. Later we will run into snipers, rocket drones that can one-shot you, Krogans that are absolutely terrifying and terrifyingly numerous, and Gecko Geth that are stupid and shouldn't exist. In order to figure out what you need to do against what can be insurmountable odds, a pause menu that allows you to give commands is imperative. And that's my point. BioWare is known for the way they blend real-time combat with pause-based strategy. That is the real reason I love this game's combat. Without a pause mechanic, it becomes just another shooter. If it is just another shooter, in order to appeal to a wider audience, the game would not be able to have AI that flanks you, surrounds you, and pounds your tender bits. We would have to just have another tired old cover shooter, and if that's how you've been playing Mass Effect, I, I feel pretty bad for you. Did I mention this game has bugs? Next we meet a guy and gal holed up in a shed near the husks and the ensuing conversations is one of the best examples of a renegade choice. Is it madness to see the future? To see the destruction rushing towards us? To understand there is no escape? No hope? No. I am not mad. I'm the only sane one left. I gave him an extra dose of his meds after the attack. Say goodnight, Manuel. You cannot silence the truth. My voice must be heard. Oh my god! What did you do? That might have been a little extreme, Commander. 
You can't just go around whacking people in the head. It was only a matter of time until he did something crazy and dangerous. I suppose you're right. By the time he wakes up, the meds will have kicked in. By combining the renegade action of knocking out Manuel and the Paragon dialogue of telling her it was essentially for her safety in case he did something crazy and dangerous, you're making Shepard a no-nonsense, doesn't play by any rules but his own type of guy while retaining his humanity. Remember, if the villain has good reasons to be doing what they're doing, they are at least sympathetic, human, and relatable. Again, however, I have a sneaking feeling that by not maximizing my renegade or paragon choices, some people might die later on, I might be locked out of choices. We shall see. A cutscene plays and Saren meets Nihilus, and Nihilus is killed off screen. We have a nicely set up long range and short range blitz encounter before we meet some more people hiding in a locked shed. This is where the system rears its ugly head. Now because I didn't want to dump all my points into both charm and intimidate stats, I only had one point in each. The first option helps us get an extra set of items, but the last choice, which gets us the name of the guy he's working with, is locked. We would have to spend nearly both the levels we got on the way here into intimidate and charm stats. This is when you start thinking to yourself as a first time player that maybe focusing on one is the best choice. And for this system, it is. But that's the problem. Once you pick a stat, you've got to live with it. It's okay, but the systems are clearly railroading you into a specific style of play. I could be wrong, but this is going to be a problem later on. Moving on. We find a lazy dude hiding behind some crates and we get attacked in an encounter spanning two floors. Did I mention this game has bugs? We defuse some bombs, kill some geth and husks, and then Ashley Williams gets the Prothean beacon blown up. Thanks, Ashley! A cutscene plays and Saren throws a temper tantrum in the middle of a Kmart because his mom, Titty McWhiskers, wouldn't buy him the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles playset. Okay. Okay, let's, let's talk about this for a minute. I understand why he's acting like this because I've played the game before. The Reaper ship is in his mind making him behave irrational, like a wild animal. It's good, but the scene doesn't communicate this effectively because it wants to save that reveal for later. But my question is, why? Have a voice speaking to him in his head that only we, us and Saren can hear. Have it cajole him, tell him he's weak and stupid and that he's failed. Then the audience thinks he's just crazy. And when the big reveal happens, it all starts to make sense. It would actually strengthen the sympathy the audience has for him once we have a complete picture of the truth. The Reaper is manipulating his mind, making him behave irrationally and changing him physiologically. I think this would also have more impact in the end when he kills himself because we talk him into it. You see, he already feels like he doesn't have a choice. And we get an option once back on the ship to piss off Ashley, and of course I don't take it because why would I? See, as it stands, Ashley is a victim of circumstances. She got sucked into the beacon just the same as anyone who was curious would have. Now, on the other hand, if Shepard told her not to go near the beacon until we could get a crew to collect it, and she went and did that shit anyway, I would have no qualms with chiding her because in that case, she disobeyed a direct order. The way these scenarios are designed now, Shepard just sounds like an asshole because the game isn't giving him a good reason to be one. He seems to just be doing it for the fun of it, similar to why Dexter used to torture cats as a wee child. Okay, maybe not that dramatic, but you get my point. At this point in the story, we have answered a call to action, entered conflict, and are deepening the conflict. Our next task is to go and gather info about Saren and expose him as a rogue agent. On to the Citadel! We confront Saren and the council seems to not want to believe what we have to say about their agent, no matter the evidence. The dock worker named Saren as the one who killed Nihilus. How did the dock worker know Saren's name if Saren wasn't there and someone didn't say his name? What this scene is saying is that the council doesn't believe humans and they must believe that at the very least that Captain Anderson would go through the elaborate process of framing Saren. They have to believe that the humans are conspiring against Saren. But why would they do that? Why would they intentionally jeopardize their chance at getting what they want? 
This is either a plot hole, or the council is stupid, or they don't really like humans, or they're reacting to the fact that Captain Anderson has a history with Saren, which, if that's the case, it's either a brilliant piece of writing or a total shit piece of writing. Either way, something about it feels a little bit off from a narrative perspective. Also, what would the CSEC investigation find exactly? They're Citadel officers and weren't on Eden Prime. Wouldn't they be suspicious if Saren couldn't account for his whereabouts? I mean, the NSA can track me down to the very bathroom that I sit writing this script. You mean to tell me that they couldn't track the whereabouts of one of their most important operatives? I mean, I know he's supposed to be covert, but even the CIA has handlers. Moving on! We're set loose to follow up on some leads, but before we go gallivanting around the Citadel, let's talk about the races. This is one of the things I believe people loved about the original Mass Effect. The Elcor are a race of, well, I guess sentient talking elephants? Who circumcised their trunks when they reached their 13th birthday? The resulting loss of manhood left them emotionless and monotone, just like how people say I speak in some of my videos. Because of this, they proceed every statement with a declaration of their current emotional state so that people know how they are feeling since their voices cannot convey emotion. Then there are the Asari. They're an all-female race who reproduce through... telepathy? I mean, they literally mindfuck, and some of the Asari DNA grabs some of the mate's DNA and a new Asari is born. Breeding with another Asari is actually seen as detrimental because it waters down the gene pool. This is an interesting side of the universe, and one that hits close to home as it's highly believed that cross-racial breeding is good for the human race as it leads to taller and smaller offspring. In fact, Darwin was one of the first to point out that homozygosity, which is the state of passing on two identical forms of a particular gene, will reduce the evolutionary fitness of a species. Asaris take this idea and instead of letting tribalism affect their decisions, they play the game of evolution and become a stronger race for their ability to love and mate with any species. Some have even taken on Krogans as lovers. Speaking of hulking tortoise-shelled lizard men, Krogans are your typical warlike species. Nothing special here, but they still manage to be a mazeball simply because of Rex. That is all. And then there's the Hanar. I love this encounter because it mimics what it would be like to mediate between two people who are bickering back and forth. The Hanar are a soft, sentient jelly that spreads what it calls the truth of the enkindlers. It is revealed that the CSEC officer is harassing the jelly for preaching in the Presidium without a permit. Because it's a big, stupid jellyfish. After talking to the Hanar and deciding to help him, we talk to the CSEC officer. The officer reveals that the preaching laws are in place simply to keep undesirables out and to prevent conflict between religious zealots. The CSEC officer feels impotent because he cannot reason with the jelly and arresting it isn't the answer either. It's up to us, but uh-oh, yeah, I was afraid of this. We don't have enough points in Intimidate or Charm to convince the jelly to stop. Now for all you console players, you have no choice at this point. Regardless of context or content, you will need to commit to one style of role-playing for the rest of the game in order to catch up to where you need to be by the end of the game to have a satisfying playthrough if you enjoy sorting things out through dialogue. But for PC players, we can cheat. Let me set this up. See, the system that is designed into the game is effectively making my experience worse. Because I want to choose options that the system, Paragon and Renegade, make harmful to my character's progression. First off, the system makes no friggin' sense. In order to say a certain thing, I have to get a reputation for saying a certain thing? I mean, does being a really good asshole make you somehow more capable of thinking up really good one-liners? No. The system makes no sense. So if I were to, I don't know, look up a way to edit my save game, or say, enable the console mode in Mass Effect, and say bump up my Paragon and Renegade levels up to max, would that be cheating or fixing a system that is preventing me from playing the game the way I want to? See, the way I see it, Paragon and Renegade levels are like your reputation. They shouldn't decide what things your brain allows you to say, but they should influence how other NPCs in the world perceive you. If you got a nasty reputation, people should be suspicious of your intentions, but if you're a good guy, 
nasty people will be suspicious of you, and so on and so forth. The way this system works, it, well, it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, maybe doesn't work is the wrong statement. It clearly works as intended, but it's stupid. If there is anything I hate about this game, it is this system. It railroads you into making certain choices and makes dialogue brainless. You don't need to think about your choices. If you're doing a Paragon run through of the game, you already know what to choose. So what is the point of giving me a choice at all? So I took it out of the equation, and as soon as I did, I breathed a sigh of relief. Finally, for the first time in about 10 playthroughs, I got to pick good, nasty, and neutral options. I got to play the game the way I wanted to. The experience was so much better after doing this. I finally completed the Hanar mission, and all the cold sweats I had experienced about losing Rex in a future mission evaporated. Elevators! Art pounding elevator action. Now we're given an opportunity to wander around the space station and gather up evidence on Saren. You do this through exploring and finding leads, which sends you to other leads in a sort of breadcrumb trail. Along the way, you'll be given options to investigate and dialogue, and just like the Presley conversation from Normandy, this dialogue tells us a whole lot about a variety of topics in less words than most RPGs. For example, Barlin Vaughn tells us about the Shadow Broker, and in fact does a really good job at setting up who this character is and how good they are at what they do by saying that he believes that the Broker is not one, but several people. How else could he or she manage to juggle so much information and seem to be everywhere at once? Along the way, I run into a mission in the embassies to talk to an Asari consort. This mission quite literally adds nothing to the game, the lore, or the world, and it's just filler, and there are a lot of these kinds of side missions in the game which you can basically skip and lose nothing for skipping it except for experience. As far as I can remember right now, the one and only mission and meaningful interaction you have with the Elcor people is this mission, unfortunately. Shepard and his crew have had enough of the side missions, so now it's off the Korra's den to get some answers, but wouldn't you know it, there's some assassins here. These guys are easily taken care of, but with all the shooting outside the club, you would think there'd be a little bit more of a commotion, but apparently the music inside's too loud or something. It doesn't seem too loud, I mean, wouldn't people be freaking out inside and hiding under tables like a nuclear attack drill during the Cold War? I mean, I know I would. We talk to Harkin inside, and he talks more about Captain Anderson than he does about the thing we actually came to talk about. Eventually, Harkin tells us that we could find Garrett at the med clinic, so we head over there and... Elevators. We head to the med clinic, clean up some bad guys, and add a weird alien cricket to our roster of soldiers. The doctor at the clinic tells us about a Corian that might be able to tell us more about Saren and what he's up to. But before that, we get to go to C-Sec and have a stare off with a huge lizard and add him to our roster of ne'er-do-wells. This is the bro regime. Well, until we get Tally. We go to Korra's den, have a gunfight, threaten to kill Fist to get him to tell us what we want, kill him regardless because that's how lizards do, head to save Tally before her life timer runs out, and hooray! Before we go to nail Saren's ass at a wall, we run into a grieving husband who wishes to have the remains of his wife returned to him, but the Alliance isn't releasing him. Then, my previous critique of the renegade options comes back full circle when the gung-ho soldier boy gets killed. Remember that time? Respectfully, Serviceman Batia may save more lives in death than she did in life. You know who and what I am. If I want Nerali Batia, I can get her. Commander, I, I don't think threats are necessary. Even if the body were here on the Citadel, would you really risk going in shooting to get it? You said you'd been briefed on me. You should know that I don't leave fallen troops behind. All right, Commander. You win. See, I told you that a good Marine never leaves a fallen soldier behind. See? I knew it. So go back and hit that like button. Later, back with the Council, we get confirmation that the Turian Counselor is a racist and the rest of the Council are a bunch of drooling idiots. So yeah, sounds about right. Wait until these assholes go by in their fucking cars! Woo! Radical bro! My car sounds like a lawnmower! <sighs> Being mentally handicapped is a politician's true nature, so these are very believable characters. That is not good enough. You know he's hiding somewhere in the Traverse. Send your fleet in! 
A fleet cannot track down one man. Uh, I'm willing to bet an entire fleet could find a lot of people. Let's think about the logic here. One squad versus 10,000 people. Who do you think could cover the most space in the least amount of time? Or it could trigger a war with the Terminus systems. We won't be dragged into a galactic confrontation over a few dozen human colonies. Uh, d didn't the Geth already commit an act of war on Eden Prime? I mean, what did the Geth need to do in order to rouse these politicians to act? If these humans are anything like the humans I know, they would have already sent their fleets into the Terminus system and would have been carpet bombing the hell out of that robot planet. I mean, are we to believe that humans have given up their warlike ways already? Hmm? All it took was a little technology and a little genital on genital action with some aliens to make us docile like Hindu cow? I think not, sir. We're made a specter in front of droves of onlookers, about 10 of them? Maybe less? Guess this wasn't that monumental an event as the game was making it out to be. We head to the Normandy, have a heart to heart with a recently fired Captain Anderson, and we shout some very humanist propaganda over the loudspeaker, and everyone seems rallied, I guess? Seems like they're just continuing to do their job and ignoring our soaring speech. On to Pharos! Pharos is no vacation spot, but the Exogeny Corporation and some adventurous colonists decided to set up shop and go digging for Prothean artifacts. Apparently, Prothean ruins take up about two-thirds of the entirety of Pharos' landmass, so this must have been a long and successful settlement for them. Buildings stretch up into the clouds and are connected by wide highways, which are, by this time, mostly crumbling. Pharos is an example of what the team did well at Bioware, and what they didn't do terribly well. First, for some missed opportunities. The side quests on this planet are complete busy work. Whereas the Citadel had quests that had you using diplomacy and info gathering which directly mirrored the main quest you were pursuing there, Pharos has you collecting Varen meat, turning on a water pipe, salvaging batteries, and killing Geth all the live long day. The Citadel missions worked for me because it fit the environment and was a unique break from what could have been constant shooting. The Saren storyline directly mirrored, for example, the Elcor and Hanar story. There was substance to them. You got to choose who you sided with and why you sided with them. In the Pharos missions, the choice is binary. Do or do not. There is no in-between. There's really nothing of substance to learn about the situation other than people need food, people need water, and get her bad. Whereas the Citadel's quest expanded the lore of the world and our understanding of it, these quests, here at Pharos, add nothing but playtime and that's my problem with this quest of this type. They add nothing and are only there to stretch the playtime, and without these distractions, which, let's face it, are exactly what these are, the game in total is about 10 hours long, maybe. That's not a bad length for a shooter, but for an RPG, people have come to expect a hell of a lot more. This game needed less padding. Think about it like this. What if Bioware ditched all the side quests on the optional planets and focused instead on another full-length story mission like, I don't know, Pinnacle Station? I think that the end product would have been a hell of a lot better. I don't know if I had made this known, but I'm not a fan of mindless busy work. I do enough of that in my day to day. I don't want to pay a company to do it in my free time. My point here is that you could do more with less if what is there is of high quality. So the side quests. Now there is an encounter with three, count them, three Krogan warriors at the end of a long hallway. There's basically one way to kill these guys, and that's to kite them into an ambush and spray them with abilities until their immunity wears off, and hope to god that more than one of them doesn't come down that hallway after you, which with this AI is, is pretty likely. They're kind of dumb. Let's talk about immunity, shall we? Immunity may seem on its face to be overpowered, and maybe it is, but if you have immunity, by the time you get access to it, you're being confronted by enemies that also have immunity, so it becomes all about who pops their ability last. That is usually who wins. The idea is to get the enemy to pop theirs and draw them into an ambush when it drops. To do this, you need to survive long enough for it to work. That's why Rex is on my team. He is the meat shield, and this, again, is where I take umbrage with the idea that this game doesn't have tactical combat. There are tactics there, but most people miss it, especially if they're playing on lower difficulties and treating this like it was just another cover shooter. 
Now it's time for the Mako. Now this poor little vehicle has been mocked for its charming physics and crazy handling, but I say those people just don't appreciate the magnificence of this piece of engineering. Loads more people say that the only way to use this Mako effectively is to zoom in and snipe enemies with your cannons. And to this I say, for shame. This is the real way to fight in a Mako. We have the stereotypical evil corporation exemplified in the cold callousness of Zhang, and juxtaposed by the caring mother looking for her daughter who is trapped in the Exogeny building. We agree to look for the daughter, and soon we're off to more antics in our Mako. Wee! The main quest is only interesting after you trek through the corpses of Krogan warriors to reveal information that a sentient telepathic flower monster is living beneath Zhu's hope. But getting there is a bit of a slog through grey, samey looking ruins and tight, cramped spaces. We find the daughter, clip some geth toenails, and head back topside for some more sweet, sexy Mako action. Then we finally get to the first moral dilemma on Pharos which we are unfortunately locked out of a choice to deal with. We either shoot the guy dead or have a shootout. There is no peaceful solution because apparently I needed to max out my intimidate before coming to Pharos. In my digging, I also find that people recommend you go to Artemis Tau first to get Liara, which makes some sense, except that, well, Pharos had urgency behind it. They were currently being attacked, but it seemed like the designers thought it should come later, since whether I do the mission first or last, I still get berated by this... person for being late. Anyway, after face blasting Zhang, we are given another moral dilemma which actually isn't a dilemma. The only choice for a non-psychopath would be to knock out the civilians with the nerve agent. Again, why would anybody put someone like Shepard in charge of anything if his go-to decision for nearly every choice is kill civilians? This is what I call a non-choice. The only reason someone would pick this choice is for the renegade points, or because they wanted to be evil, or because they wanted to see what happens when they kill civilians. It's not an interesting choice because it is morally black and white without any sort of gray in between. Once the civilians are safe asleep, we come to the Thorian, and I remember thinking this was a cool sequence the first time I ran through it, but now, I just feel like it's tedious. And the controls and the absolute brain dead team AI make certain situations a kite and kill only situation due to the fact that both the Asari and the Creepers, who seem to take far too many hits to kill, all rush you. Now, I don't have a problem with the rushing. It's actually a good tactic because she uses a shotgun and can hide in a crowd of creepers. But why do these damn things have so much health? They're absolute bullet sponges. The thing that I learned in this fight is that in close up combat, the team AI is useless, which means the shotgun against rushing enemies is useless, which means the shotgun is almost useless. It seems to excel only when your team AI is the one doing the rushing, but god forbid when the AI moves away, then Rex just stands there like his mother has forgotten his birthday and served him eggs instead of chocolate chip pancakes for breakfast. So I switched to a longer range option. With the Thorian dead and Shep's mind effectively scrambled by the cipher, we finally get to hang up on the council. Ah. Feels good, man. Artemis Tau is... well, it's not very good. Of all the levels in this game, this one has almost zero interaction, way too much focus on the Mako, or does it? A few very sparse encounters on the ground, and one actual good, well-designed fight with an armature. Later, you have to fight a Krogan, and I hate this fight. Basically, the only way to not get killed is to focus on the Krogan and kite the rest of the Geth around pillars until they die. Your squad, like my squad, will be useless, mainly because of the sparse cover and the fact that you spawn in the fight out in the open. I think Rex died almost immediately, and by the end of the fight, it was just me and Tally running around like nope, 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 nope. I free Liara get a cutscene of the whole place doing an Indiana Jones impression, and Liara melds with my mind. This is the weakest part of the game, and the shortest, so since Bioware didn't put any thought into this level, I won't put any into this part of the video. 
Next, as soon as we land on Novaria, someone tries to take our weapons, and this is yet another example of what people like about Mass Effect, or at least what I like. There was something that always bothered me about certain RPGs. When someone asks you to give up your weapons, most of the time you could protest. But if you wanted to go through those doors, you were doing so unarmed most of the time. But here, you're a certified badass. You'll take Shepard's weapons once you pry them out of his cold, dead hands. Captain Shepard by way of Clint Eastwood. I think this is why so many people are drawn to this game, and the mission is a shining example of actual meaningful choice in the game. For the first time, we are met with a choice that feels weighty when we meet the Rachni. While we may not be able to save Liara's mother, just bringing Liara along has weight because even though it's just one line before her mother attacks us, the mother reacts to that decision. The scene overall falls a little flat without too much emotional resonance, but to be honest, there seemed to be some distance between the two of them anyway, which we find out more about later in the game when we approach Liara in her quarters. The real weight of this moment is when we get to decide the fate of the Rachni Queen. But first... Did I mention this game's buggy? Because it is. First off, the processing of the Rachni Queen's vocals are eerie and the mechanism through which she speaks is even more so. It uses the Asari Commando's corpse as a puppet for which to communicate with us. Now, if we know what the future holds for the Rachni, we might be inclined to kill it. But in my first playthrough, I had no idea about Sovereign or the big reveal on Vermeer, so the Rachni didn't seem like a threat simply because she seemed rational. Now I knew about indoctrination, but I couldn't know what would happen in Mass Effect 3, so even though this thing had the ability to control minds of even dead bodies, and even with Rex's protests, I let the psychic bug live. I let her live this time around in reality because I know what happens in Mass Effect 3 and it's total bullshit, but I won't go into that here. But without the knowledge of what happens in 3, this is a part of the reason I fell in love with this game. Through the bugs, the terrible AI, and the occasional leap in plot logic the game takes, it was the choices that kept me playing and playing again and playing again. This choice had weight because if I let the Rachni live, I am taking a chance of being lied to or the Rachni being used by the Reapers against me, and if I killed it, I would be wiping out an entire species from the universe. It was almost a not-win situation. It was like a catch-22. That decision was a tough one on my first playthrough, and as I've said in other videos, if a game makes me stop and agonize over a decision I'm making, they've done a good job. Now let's move on to Vermeer. Vermeer is excellent, mainly because we're confronted with two important decisions and a reveal that honestly on my first time through took me by surprise. I'm not going to ruin the surprise for you, but in this mission you can lose not one, but two characters if you fail to max your charm or intimidate. It's hard to go through this mission without ruining. Suffice to say, if you haven't played this game yet, what the hell are you waiting for? You can basically get it for free on Origin. And since I don't want to ruin the game for the one person out there that hasn't played it, let's answer the question that I posed at the beginning of this video. Why do people like Mass Effect? Well, as always, I can only speak for myself, but I think the reason Mass Effect has endured the test of time to become a beloved franchise is because it tried to do something that not many other games were attempting to do, which was combine real-time combat with strategic turn-based combat to combine an FPS with pen and paper stats, role-playing choices with shorter dialogue that flowed and seemed natural, while not bogging down and dragging out the game with huge dumps of text. The latter brought in a more casual RPG audience, while the former brought in the hardcores. This synergy of seemingly opposing systems is what made Mass Effect a success. But what is Mass Effect's legacy? Was Mass Effect good for the RPG genre on the whole? What do you think? What are your favorite parts of Mass Effect and what do you wish would have been done better? Leave your comments below and let me know. And this has been a rant from strategy and now that you heard it, go play some games.